Well, I hope you all have had a good week this week and uh, are excited, I hope, about today being able to be together on the Lord's Day. Uh, it is good to see you. Our daughter, Deidre, is not here today uh, because uh, our son has volunteered once a month to take her to the Woodlawn Christian Church, which is in South Knoxville, because they have a special needs class that Dee absolutely loves. Now, she likes coming here. She really likes coming here, but she misses that class, and they were having kind of a Thanksgiving party today. So that's where she is, and uh, we'll pick her up uh, after church, and she'll, she'll ask, did anybody ask about me? And several of you did, so I will tell her, yeah, they did. Well, this being the first Sunday in November, can you believe it's November already? I, I don't know. I, I guess as we get older, time seems to go a whole lot quicker. And uh, it's hard for me to believe that it, this is the first of November. Being the first of the month, there's a lot of things we could talk about. A lot of things going on. We could talk about the election and some of the fears of what may happen depending on what goes on with the election. We could talk about the virus and what's happening with that and how that all the time is all over the news. Uh, we, we could talk about the economy, uh, the loss of jobs or the creation of jobs or some places doing well, some places not doing well. We, 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 we could talk about the unrest in our country and some of the riots. All those things are depressing. So what I really want us to do is to learn this month more and more about Thanksgiving. I want us to learn what it really means when we use the term Thanksgiving. Now, of course, you know that we have a national holiday coming up, uh, not too far from now, Thanksgiving Day, which everybody, I think, celebrates in different ways. I've heard all kinds of different traditions. One fellow described Thanksgiving as the 3F holiday, family, football, and feast. And, and for a lot of people, that's really what it's all about. Now, I will just comment on that last one, and that's the feast part. I don't know whether any of you ever overdo it on Thanksgiving dinner. I do. I just prepare myself that I'm going to overdo it on Thanksgiving dinner. I love to eat, and uh, I happen to be married to a very good cook, and I enjoy everything she fixes. Uh, I especially enjoy the feast of Thanksgiving. But Thanksgiving feast is not the subject this month. You're not going to get any recipes from me or suggestions about food. I do know one recipe. It's for a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I do that well. Other than that, I'm not a cook at all. So this is not about the Thanksgiving feast. Rather, I want to talk to you this month about having a feast of Thanksgiving. Because real thanksgiving, not a holiday, but real thanksgiving, a real spirit and attitude of gratitude is life-changing. You have probably known, and maybe some of you have been like this, when you've been in a dark place in your life where, where your focus is on either what you don't have or what you have that you wish you didn't have. And it's hard to be thankful in those situations, isn't it? And when you talk to some people who are very negative and very unhappy and just, just grumbling all the time, what, what you find often is they are people who don't know how or have not learned how to be grateful. And I want to suggest to you that a grateful spirit, a grateful attitude to God is life-changing. And the solution to some of the negative stuff that we're facing is for us to learn this attitude of gratitude. So this month, I want to spend the whole month encouraging us to learn what it is to be thankful. The question this morning, though, is why should we be thankful? Considering all that's going on, why should we be thankful? Well, today, because of who God is. And to help us think about that, I want to read a familiar psalm. Uh, I will probably read it three times today. It's the 100th psalm. Uh, maybe you know it very well, but let me read it for you. The psalmist said, shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. You are probably familiar with the fact that some people call this and a song, Old 100. 
Now, you may know that as the doxology. Do you know the word doxology comes from the Greek? Glory words is really what that word means. And you probably know the doxology. Maybe you didn't know that's what it's called. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. You know that song. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You, 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 you know those words. Those are glory words. And they come really from the hundredth psalm. So let's study the psalm and learn what we can from it this morning about thanksgiving. First, as I read the 100th Psalm, number one, I see there is a call to action. There is a call to action. Did you listen to the words of the psalm? Did you listen to some of the things that the psalm calls us to do? Not to know, that comes later, but to do. They are action words. This is what I call the what of thanksgiving. The what of thanksgiving. What is involved in giving thanks? Well, let's define the word thanksgiving. It simply means to give thanks. And here, we're not talking about what we teach our children, the magic words of please and thank you, although that's radically important. We're talking about being thankful to God and expressing to Him our appreciation. Because you see, if thanksgiving really happens, then it has to be expressed. Now, one mother asked her little son, said, did you thank your uncle for the gift he gave you? And the boy said, yes, but I didn't tell him. How can you do that? You, you can't really thank somebody without expressing it. Now, we might even consider ourselves to be a very grateful people. And I have to be very careful that I don't find myself in my prayers giving a few thank yous for something that God is or something God has done and then getting into my laundry list, which is rather long, of all the things I really want God to do. You see, sometimes I think we forget the importance for us. Now, God doesn't need it, but the importance for us to express thanksgiving to Him. And so that's really what the 100th Psalm is calling us to do. Now, let me read it again. I want to read it again, okay? Listen for the action words. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name. For the Lord is good, and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Actions. This is a, a good list for us to think about. As a matter of fact, there are seven imperatives in that psalm, the 100th psalm. Notice them. He says, in these words of the psalm, shout, worship, come, know, enter, give, and praise. These are things to do, action words, imperatives. Drop down in the next psalm, the 101st psalm, verse 1. Listen to what it says. I will sing of your love and justice to you, O Lord, to you. Notice that. To you, O Lord, I will sing praise. It's not just a matter of singing about God. It's a matter of singing to God. Do, do we do that? It's not just a matter of saying good things about God. It's a matter of saying good things to God. It's not just a matter of saying how much we appreciate the blessings we have. Count your many blessings. The hymn says, name them one by one. Good song. But do we express to God our words of appreciation for the things he has done for us? So what I'm doing this morning is inviting you to put your thanksgiving in, into action. To do things. This is the what of thanksgiving. Now, I, I suspect some of you are sports fans. I know that. Uh, have you ever watched a ball game where the players start doing this, looking towards the stands? What, 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 are, what are they doing? They're trying to get the fans involved in the game. They, they want to hear the fans' response. They want the fans to respond to what's going on on the field. You understand that. And I will tell you that if I'm a, sitting watching a ball game by myself on television, which I do, uh, I'm pretty uh, mellow. Uh, even if my team is winning or losing, I'm, I'm just kind of quiet. But boy, you get in the, in the stands with a group of people and you get more into it. You, just, you, you kind of become more expressive. The, the crowd kind of helps you to cheer your team on. Th there are things that you do to express your appreciation for what's going on on the field. Now, sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll pan around and they'll show a candid shot in, on a ball game and Here's a guy sound asleep. 
He's at the game, but he's not in the game. Okay. Or here's a couple, and, and they're just talking back and forth while the game's going on. They're at the game, but they're not in the game. And when we come together for corporate worship, or when we worship privately, I find personally that the more I involve my whole being in expressing thanksgiving to God, the more I'm in thanksgiving. Now, I think we all understand the concept of doing things verbally, that is, saying, Lord, thank you for whatever. But do we understand expressing thanksgiving physically? Uh, you, you may notice, I don't turn around, look at you, but you may notice that sometimes during worship, I'll, I'll raise my hands in, in worship. Now, you know, I know that's a little foreign to some people. It shouldn't be, because you understand physically expressing appreciation because when the flag goes by, do you do this? Well, what is that? That's a physical expression of what you feel about our country. You should. Do you stand when the flag goes by? Yes, you should. You see, we're used to physical expression in other areas. Why, why doesn't it happen as much in worship? You see, when I read the 100th Psalm, the, the, the imperatives call us to do something. There's action for us both verbally and physically. And in my opinion, this is my opinion, the more I am concentrating on expressing things to God, the more sometimes I want to do something that uh, maybe is not in the ordinary. I notice the words in the psalm. Did you notice this? He, he says, shout for joy. He used the word gladness and joyful songs. And so I think in worship, whether it's private worship at home by myself or here together at church, I think it's perfectly okay. Matter of fact, I'm not sure it's not dangerous. If you feel this welling up inside of you, if you don't let it out, it may blow your eardrums. I don't know. It's okay to say Amen. It's okay. It's okay to raise your hand in worship. Didn't we all teach our children that when you pray, there's a physical response? Bow your head, close your eyes. You see, physical response is a good thing. Uh, back a good many years ago in the church where we were in Illinois, a gentleman started attending just uh, out of curiosity. He'd heard a lot about the church. He was an associate minister at another church. And he started coming to our early service, our 8 o'clock service, just to check things out. He fell in love with the church and has become such an active part of it. And I will tell you, when R.J. is in church, you know R.J. is in church. Because he is one of these who encourages the preacher. Preach it, brother. I mean, you've, you've heard, if you've been here, you may have heard Dee do that. She asked me, every, do you need my help today, Dad? And sometimes when things are going a little slow, I'll say, D, help me out. And she'll say, preach it, brother. And everybody has a good laugh. And then we go on to something a little different. I, I believe that this what of Thanksgiving involves more than just verbally. It obviously involves verbally. But I think it goes farther than that. Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 11, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. On Wednesday night, we are doing a study of the parables, and I commented either this week or last week. But it, it's kind of interesting to me how often Jesus uses the illustration of a banquet, a feast, a party to illustrate the kingdom of God. And yet, for many of us, we have been taught that you need to fold your hands and be quiet and be very somber. Now, there's a place for that. But I think there's also a place for a glory, hallelujah, praise God. It's okay. If we're doing it from a heart that really is wanting to express appreciation to God, to worship Him. So, the first thing I find in the psalm is there's a call to action. That's verbally and physically. But let me move on. Number two, the action is in response to who God is. The action is in response to who God is. Now, this is what I call the why of thanksgiving. Why? Why should I express thanks to God verbally? Why should I raise my hand in worship? Why should I say hallelujah when something special happens that I see as a blessing from God? Why should I do any of that? Well, there are a lot of reasons for us to be thankful. But the greatest reason is because of who God is. That's the why. That's why we express thanks. Again, listen to the psalm. The 100th Psalm, verse 3, know that the Lord is God. 
It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Literally, what that psalm says is, know that Yahweh is God. Now, we can thank him for a whole lot of things that he's done. As a matter of fact, everything that we have is good has come from God. But I'm not saying that we begin to thank him because of what he's done. We begin to thank him most of all for who he is. Now, I will tell you that I could give you a whole long list of things that my wife does for our family. But the greatest thing is who she is. It's not just her actions, it's her person. And when we begin to look at God as not the great Santa Claus in the sky, but we see God as our Father who calls us his people, then we begin to understand the reason that we come to worship him. As a matter of fact, I would say the reason why if we're Christians, we can't help but worship him. Let me back up a little bit in the Psalms to the 95th Psalm. The psalmist says, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great king of all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. And the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Now, we know that we are not to have other gods before him. That's one of the commandments. We know that we're not to worship idols. And I think one of the dangers that we all face is that there are things that draw our attention, and if we're not careful, can draw our attention above our relationship to God. Things can become our God. Uh, our families could become our God. Our hobbies could become our God. Our fears could become our God. Our worries could become our God. Our finances could become our God. On and on and on the list goes. And you understand, folks, that what we worship is what we serve. Paul talks about the non-believers, the pagans, in Romans chapter 1. He says in verse 21, For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. You see, they knew about God, but they stopped being grateful. And they began to worship the creation instead of the creator. And so I find that the benefit of being a thankful people not only is that it expresses thanks to God, not only is it good for us, but I believe it helps keep us on track in the right relationship with the God who made us and who loves us. So I believe we need to be intentional in offering thanks to God. I think that when we begin to think about our prayer list, we need to especially look at the beginning to offer thanks before we even ask for what we need. Yes, we're supposed to ask for what we need. But you think about the attributes of God. You think about God's perfection, God's holiness, God never changes, God's great love, God's covenant with humanity, God's gift of his son. You begin to think about all of the things that he has done and related to all the things that he is, the beauty of God. Uh, if you were out last night trick-or-treating, <laughs> I hope you saw the moon. Wow! D did, that, did that bring about a God, you did a good job with that. I think God accepts that kind of word. To be able to look at creation, all of creation, the, the, the heavens declare the glory of God. Do we, declare a God. do we declare God's glory to him because of what he's done? Yes. But also because of who he is. God, you are the creator. You have made all things. Now, the 100th Psalm says God is good. Where we run into a little bit of a problem, I think, is we begin to look at life, and when things aren't going good, we begin to question even the goodness of God. But God doesn't change. God loves us so much, he sent his son into the world to do something for us we could never do. No matter how hard we try, even on my best day, I could not be good enough to be able to know God. But praise God, I don't have to be good enough. Because he came into this world in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, to offer to me and to you 
life now, real life now, and life everlasting. Does that not elicit from us prayers of thanksgiving? Does that cause us sometimes to say, praise you, Father, for who you are? Just the simple fact of being able to pray the Lord's Prayer. Do, do, you, do, do you know what you actually say at the very beginning to the almighty, all-powerful, perfect God? You say, Father. Just to be able to call him Father. I ought to bring about some thanksgiving. God, thank you that you, that you allow me to say Father. And so I begin to think about this concept of worship and of thanksgiving and of having a feast of thanksgiving and causing us to realize what it really means to thank God. Let me give you a little, uh, let me read for you a worship service so, so you'll know a little bit about what's going on. It's, a, it's what's going on in heaven. The book of Revelation, uh, one of the books that I really love. I know a lot of people don't like the book of Revelation. I, I enjoy the book of Revelation. Uh, listen to what... Uh, John saw, Revelation 4, beginning with verse 8. He's talking about what's going on in heaven. He says, each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings, day and night. They never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. By the way, if you need a word of thanksgiving, you, you can use those words. It's okay to read God's word back to him. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever, forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Sometimes if you're having a little trouble thinking about what to say to God, just read to him some of those words of praise that you find throughout the Bible where you express to him because of who he is, how grateful you are that you can actually call him Father. Now that leads me to the third thing I find in the 100th Psalm. And that is that the action comes because of the relationship. The action of being grateful and expressing that gratitude because of who he is comes because of the relationship. This is what I call the how of thanksgiving. The how of thanksgiving. What do I mean by that? How can we, sinful beings, come into the presence of Almighty God? Uh, you sang just a little bit ago. I, I, I assume you meant it when you sang it. I did. Prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. By the way, you know you can sing a lie as well as telling a lie, so don't sing it if you don't mean it. Prone to wonder. Lord, I, I feel it. And so here I am, a person who has failed God, who has not always kept my promises. I, I appreciate the fact that the Apostle Peter uh, that uh, Steve read from was able to write some of the things that he wrote after he came back to God. I appreciate the fact that, that, that we are frail human beings who have failed God. And yet, he has done something amazing. He has invited us into a relationship with him. Now, don't miss what the 100th Psalm says in verse 3. Know that the Lord is God. That's something not just to do, but to know. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Now, of course, you know that the book of Psalms was written for the people of Israel. By the way, this is, I'm reading this morning from probably Jesus' hymn book. Now, the Psalms are really poetry, Hebrew poetry, and probably what we're reading are some of the things that Jesus actually sang during his time on the earth. But notice the relationship here. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And how can we as sinful human beings come into his presence? It's because he has invited us, not just into his presence, but into a relationship with him. The fifth verse of the 100th Psalm says, The Lord is good and his love endures forever. 
His faithfulness continues through all generations. This is his covenant love. This is the promise. God does not change. God's love is always available. Now, we can reject it, and we can take God's grace and abuse it and make it cheap and think, well, God's going to forgive me. That's his business, so I can live however I want to. We can do that, but that breaks the relationship. Don't you understand? And so I begin to think about this matter of thanksgiving, and I understand it's a gift, not because God needs it, but because it makes me a better person. It makes me a better person. It gives me a sense of joy. It gives me a sense of fulfillment. It gives me a sense of relationship with God. When I begin to understand that God has opened the way for me into his presence by sending his son who is the way, the truth, and the life, who came into this world to show us the Father, to invite us to the Father, and then to be the bridge between sinful humanity and perfect God. And for those of us who have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that message of the cross is life-changing. He has paid my debt. He has offered for me the perfect sacrifice. And because I made a decision a long time ago, confessed that name by faith and was baptized into him, I have that promise of an invitation into the very presence of the Father. And so you begin to see that offering thanksgiving is even a gift. It's a gift of God's grace that comes because of our relationship with the Father. Now, there's a passage of Scripture that I've already read several times in the almost uh, how many months, 10, 11 months I've been with you folks. I'm going to read it again because it's one of my favorite passages that says who you are, those of you who are Christ followers. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. It's written to Christians. It's written to you who are Christians, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Mercy. You see, if you really believe that about yourself, it moves you to thanksgiving. It moves you to want to express however you can your appreciation to God. And that, of course, begins with giving our lives to Him, receiving Him as our Father and Jesus as our Lord and Savior and the Holy Spirit as an indwelling presence within us. And when we begin to do that, we begin to want to more and more just thank God for who He is. Don't, don't squelch that desire for thanksgiving. It's good for you. And it's needed. Paul writes in Colossians chapter 2, Verses 6 and 7. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Do you see how that changes us? You've, you've all known people who were ungrateful. You've all known people who struggled with being able to appreciate anybody else because it was all about them. You've all known people like that. One solution, of course, is for them to meet Jesus and understand what it is to really be loved. But then another step for them is to come to the place where they can be thankful, where you can be thankful, where I can be thankful. Gratitude is life-changing, and the ability to even offer to God words of thanksgiving and actions of thanksgiving come because of His grace in inviting us. So, let's have a feast of giving thanks to Almighty God. Let's put our gratitude into action. Learn to see God involved. I mentioned seeing the moon last night. Oh, wow. Unbelievable. It was beautiful. But did we see God in that? Learn to see God in little things. And learn to take time during the day when, when something good happens or when you're spared from something bad that might happen. Just say, Lord, thank you for that. 
It, it, it's, a, it's a habit that you develop that is life-changing. To, to go out of here today and, and just say, Lord, thank you for the opportunity of having the freedom and the health to be able to attend today. Practice thanksgiving. Start your day with prayers of thanks. Pausing during the day to thank him for what you see and what you think about. Put your gratitude into action. And I will guarantee it will be life-changing and attitude-changing, and you'll see the difference. So let me read it one more time. The 100th Psalm. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us. We're his. We're his people. The sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. And so as we get ready to conclude this service, let me say to you who may need to hear this, that the first act of response to who God is, is to obey him as we receive his son, Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior. You've heard me say it before. I like to illustrate it this way. There is a line. Before that line, I'm not in relationship with God. And the reason is because I've not come to that place, that line, to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. The Bible says to those who received him, to those he gave the right to become children of God. And so if you've never crossed that line where you've said, I'm no longer in charge, he's in charge. He's my Lord, he's my Savior. I want him in my life. If you've never crossed that line, it's an opportunity today and any day to make that decision. It's a matter of faith, trusting what God has said he will do, trusting Jesus' sacrifice to be sufficient, good enough to cover your sin. And with that faith comes the decision to turn away from stuff you know not pleasing to God. It's called repentance. Being willing to confess before people, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then stepping down in the waters of baptism to allow yourself to be buried with Christ as Paul says in Romans 6, to rise, to walk in newness of life. And to know, because God has said it, it's true. Your sins are forgiven. You have the gift of the Holy Spirit. And now you're a new person. And so in just a moment, worship team is going to lead us in singing. If you have a decision to make for the Lord, come on. Somebody will be here to meet you at the front. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you've given me words this morning and breath and a place to worship and people to worship with. I thank you for First Christian Church of Morristown and for the time we've been able to be here. It's because of your grace and mercy. Thank you. Father, I thank you that, uh, that there is love and unity in this place. And I thank you for the history of this place and for all that's been accomplished. And I thank you that you've not left here, but you're still very involved. So, Father, teach us. Teach us how to see things for which to be grateful. Teach us to know how to express our gratitude. And help us, Father, to be a faithful, grateful people. In Jesus' name.